Welcome to section two on self society and belonging. And in this part one, I will be introducing you to this uh, topic that I will be leading you through for the next three weeks of, of lecture content. The section aims are set out here. I am going to be introducing you to some key sociological concepts. We will be examining a series of classical and contemporary sociological studies to help us understand those concepts. And I'll be encouraging you to use these concepts to think sociologically about your own lives. And really what I want you to be doing as we work through these concepts is be thinking about how do these help me understand the social arrangements around me? How do they help me better understand social identities and social inequalities? And what I've done here is I've set out the themes that cover this section too. And the first is that self is a social product. So what does this mean? Well, we often think of ourselves as primarily a private domain, a kind of inner realm of personal thoughts and values and emotions. And that might feel largely self-evident, but is in contrast to the way in which sociologists study the framing of personal identity and the self. So as we already know from the, the lecture content on thinking sociologically, sociology demonstrates the need to look at the impact of other people, of wider society, and the cultural forms and moral norms in the making of the self. The second point here is that self and society are mutually constitutive because neither self nor society can be understood independently of each other. So sociologists focus on the relationship between them. In other words, the sort of person that you are is shaped by the society or societies you inhabit. But at the same time, you participate in the making of that society. One cannot exist without the other. Belonging is a key theme, actually, across all of the contents we'll be looking at. And it's really important because it helps us understand this relationship between the self and society and acts as a kind of barometer, a measure for social change. It uh, is person-centred, the idea of belonging. It's about our sense of ease or indeed unease with ourself and our, our surroundings. And so it can be developed through our interactions with others, but also through more abstract notions such as collectively held values or expectations. Belonging takes us into the everyday where official and unofficial spheres interact in a way that often goes unnoticed or is not the focus of our thoughts. We don't really pay attention to how we do this belonging, but when it is disrupted, we can feel uprooted. So it's not just about familiarity and it's not enough just to understand how we might feel that we belong. We want to understand better how belonging works. It also allows us to help us see the relationship between self and society as complex and multidimensional. We don't belong into one group, but often many, and sometimes they can be competing. And its dynamic nature helps us understand social change. Belonging isn't something that is static. It moves and changes across time and space and in response to changes in ourself um, and, and what's happening in our lives. If we think about becoming new parents, for example, suddenly we start to occupy new places and spaces and we do things that invoke different forms of belonging, like going to toddler groups or um, having visits from health visitors or coffee mornings and, and then be at the school gates and, and those kind of things. So we can see how physical spaces can also change over time through sociodemographic changes and that affects our sense of belonging. But belonging is also something that is contested. And in that sense, it means there's not a fixed agreement on what it can mean. It can exclude as well as include, offer security and insecurity. It means space needs to be made and so spaces also need to be closed off. It can be temporal. It doesn't have to be something that is lasting and it can be taken away from us. And sometimes we seek not to belong, to not conform to get us out of our comfort zone and to broaden our minds. 
And the last thing we're going to be looking at across all of our material is this relationship between concepts that we use in the everyday, so in our everyday language as ordinary social actors, and concepts as they're used by sociologists and anthropologists and crim criminologists. Why concepts? Why are we even here? Well, concepts are everywhere. They are essential to our everyday lives, but we really notice them. They help us organise and categorise the world around us, and they provide us with tools we need to give meaning to our social world. So let's think about concepts a little more carefully. Here's one definition of concepts. It's kind of more or less what I've just said, and you can pause here to read that carefully. But more or less what this says is that concepts help us to sociologically analyze the world around us. They help us to organize this world. They help us to communicate meaning and build understanding and make suggestions about the social world based on what we observe. But as it says in this quote, the malleability of concepts is important. They change and evolve over time. They mean different things in different contexts. So we need to think carefully and adopt a critical stance when we are using concepts to help us understand our social world. So we're using concepts not just to describe, but to help us defamiliarize the familiar, to make the known strange, to unpack to see, behind, to see behind, to, to question, to help us cultivate our sociological imagination. So how might we do that? Well, there are different ways of thinking about concepts. So let's break this down a, even more. First of all, we can think of concepts as historical. So they emerge from particular social and political contexts. Um, but they might be used today in similar but also different ways. So in this sense, a concept has a trajectory and meanings that accrue to them over time and space. And concepts might seem relevant and common sense in one culture, may seem abhorrent or confusing from another perspective. And a note of caution, just because we might be looking at concepts that have been developed historically, it doesn't mean that they no longer have relevance. It's just their meaning may have changed. Concepts are contested. The meaning of concepts are debated, even among sociologists. The term contested concept refers to the idea that a particular concept doesn't have an agreed or fixed definition. And definitions depend on how we want to use the concept. And then we have this relationship of social scientific concepts as they're used in the social sciences and how they're used in the everyday. Arguably, the best and the most original ideas in the social sciences tend to become appropriated and utilised by social actors themselves. However, there is a risk as these concepts enter into the everyday that the most innovative ideas become banal. And this is important because concepts are often adopted and used by so-called ordinary people, but not necessarily with the same meanings that social scientists intended. And sometimes they may be used by social scientists to reflect everyday meanings without questioning whether, in fact, the concept is helping us to understand the social world or whether it is reinforcing social divides and social inequalities. And it's really important we think about this process sociologically as well, how social science concepts are taken up and used by lay actors and social scientists. And one way of looking at this appropriation, this process of appropriation, is if we draw on the distinction as set out by Brubaker and Cooper between categories of practice and categories of analysis. Now, this is a challenging read, so stick with it, go back to it, and keep going back to it over the next few weeks. But what they argue, or they give us a tool with which to explore concepts in greater depth and in a critical way. They give us this framework. So they define categories of practice as a way of classifying people or things that are regarded as having shared characteristics in everyday non-scientific terms, often about everyday social experiences. 
and categories of practice are often used to communicate political, journalistic or religious common sense. Now, common sense is something that is actually fantastic and practical. It helps us make decisions and answer questions in the moment and understand why something maybe have happened in the past. But there is a paradox. And even if common sense helps us make sense of the world, it can also undermine our ability to understand it. And again, this goes back to this question of defamiliarizing the familiar and taking things for granted or taking particular social re arrangements as a given. Now, categories of analysis are a classification that have an analytical value. That is, it is used to help us better understand the social world, to describe patterns and trends and phenomena that we see. Race is a good example of this. So race is a key concept in sociology and other disciplines used to describe physical, social, cultural and political differences between people. But it's used as a key concept when we know there is no such thing as races. Right? There's only one race. And if we use race to analyse social processes based on so-called races, then this risks taking for granted that race actually exists. But the effects of race and racism are real. So we do need to engage with this to analyse the social reality. So we have a category of practice and a category of analysis. And we have to understand the kind of traffic between them. And the use of something as a category of practice doesn't necessarily disqualify it as a category of analysis. Because if it did our analytical vocabulary, the language you use to analyse would be really poor. So just to recap, categories of practice are referred to the everyday language used by social actors and some social scientists to explain the social world. And categories of analysis refers to the analytical language used by social scientists to explore and explain and understand the social world. And there's a heavy traffic between the two. And if we start to think of concepts being used as either a category of practice or a category of analysis, this can help us understand, well, what is it helping us to analyse? How useful is it? But it also helps us engage critically with that very concept. So in this section, we're going to be exploring the following concepts. Identity, moral panic, impression management and roles, emotional labour, stigma and community. And some of these will be very familiar to you. Others will be new. But they're all used to describe the social world in particular ways, which helps us challenge what seems taken for granted and it helps us also critically engage with how we understand that social world. And all of these concepts are essential to really understanding the relationship between self, society and belonging. And before I move on to the, 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 last, um, the last slide, I just want to make a note on empirical evidence and illustrative examples and say that as we move through this course, we are going to be presenting you with academic research, with journal articles and book chapters that are what we would call academic literature, where they use theoretical ideas and research that has been done to help us understand those ideas that give your arguments weight and support. And this is really the essential evidence we would like to see you engage with when you develop your academic writing. But we'll also be using illustrative examples and they may come from outside of academia. They may take the form of art or literature or open ed pieces or podcasts. And it's really important that they might not necessarily strengthen your arguments, but can give it originality and style. But you shouldn't really rely on them in order to give weight to the arguments that you want to make. And you'll see on the course Moodle, I have embedded in there a storyboard for our topic, where I have posted a series of a, a range of materials, multimedia materials, which are doing precisely that. They are there to provide illustrative examples and bring to life some of the ideas 
So take your time and go through these and you'll see a range of things there to help us really understand, well, what does, what does it mean when we think about identity in terms of representation? How do we understand emotional labour? So take your time to go through these, but please don't rely on these as the evidence for your arguments. Rather, go to the extensive reading list that will help you engage with the theoretical and conceptual ideas.